function block that you want to have in almost all of your controllers. The second thing we have in series is the COM initialization block. And I'll show you, you can find that under the COM menu and then COM port and then in it for initialization. So that's where I grab that from. And we'll open it up and see. Within the COM initialization block, we have a few different parameters that we can define. The first one is the COM port. And I'll click that down. And you'll see we have the options of COM 1, 2, and 3. Now it's important to point out that these COM 1, 2, and 3, these are referring to the physical ports on the side of the controller. It's not to be confused with the software port number that Windows assigns. If you're using, a, for example, a USB to serial adapter, you'll notice you may have COM 7 or 6 or 5 or 4 assigned in Windows, and that's the port that you originally you pick in the communication and OS settings for VisiLogic when you want to download a program, for example. But the COM port numbers, you'll see it only goes up to three. That's because it's referring to the maximum number of COM ports that you can have. For example, on a 200 series or a 500 series, you can have up to three COM ports. So that's why we have COM 1, 2, and 3. And in this case, I had selected COM 2 because I have, in this case, the, the serial cable is plugged in between my two controllers on COM port 2. Baud rate, you just need to make sure that you match the baud rate on both COM ports for both controllers. And this will most likely be a spec that is given to you if you're using any type of third-party device. Some may only talk at 9600. Some may talk at you know 19,200. It's just important to make sure that you match the baud rate. And if you're using Unitronics controllers, you can actually use the maximum. I just had it on 57K in this case, but it's, it's not really so relevant. You just have to make sure you match them between your your different slave devices on the serial network. The standard, I have it selected as RS32 in this case because I'm just a point to point, but if you are actually a more likely scenario having multiple slaves on your Modbus network, you're going to want to use the RS485 option which allows you to daisy chain multiple controllers together. Uh, we do have a, a an adapter available which allows you to daisy chain more than one serial port. So you have a serial port that comes out and expands into two into two uh, ports so you can actually daisy chain over the RS-485 network. The other options here are really, again, you just have to make sure you match them between your specified uh, device parameters from the third-party device. The most common is 8, 9, and 1 for your parity or your data bits, your parity, and your stop bits. 8 and on 1 is the most common, but if you do have a device that is different, you have the option to select to make sure you match them. RS-232 timeout, you can leave that at the standard uh, half a second. And that's all that we really need to define within this COM initialization block. If we're using a modem, you'd want to select under here, but that's, that's another topic for another day. In this case, though, we'll just leave it as none. We have our COM port defined, our parity bits, and our, our standard RS-232. And that's all that needs to be in here. Now, Modbus config block. This is what's telling us that we want to be able to talk Modbus over this COM port 2 that we just defined. So I'll show you. You grab this block from the function blocks menu. Modbus and then configuration is this first one that we have in the last um, block in net one. I'll open it up. You'll see you have the option to define it a name. Modbus one is what it's named as default, but you can give it any sort of name that you like. Within the block here, you have to again specify that you're going to be using port two for Modbus. So we just defined the, the settings for port 2 in the common init block. Now we have to tell the Modbus configuration block that we are going to be using port 2. In this case, again, you can see you have 1, 2, or 3 for the three available maximum COM ports. We're using COM 2 in this case. Network ID. Each controller on the Modbus network has to have its own unique network ID. 
and you can see if you drop down, it ranges from 1 to 255 are the available options. Uh, so if you're using an RS-485 network, I believe the network ID starts at around somewhere around 40 as a valid network ID, but it's just important to make sure that each device on the Mobbus network has its own unique network ID, because that's how we're really going to be addressing and telling the, that's how the master goes out and finds its slave devices, you target it for the correct network ID. So in this case, we made our master beat network ID 1. You'll see later that the slave in this uh, demo that we have is defined as network ID 2. Our master is 1, as defined in the Modbus config block. Timeout and retries. The default is 103. You can generally leave it as that standard. And then the last option the, under the out parameter is a memory bit. You want to make sure you assign a memory bit here, which is going to be your function in progress bit. So this bit is going to be high whenever a command is currently being sent or some, some action is currently in progress, as the name denotes. So you use this just to make sure that you don't uh, override that you don't uh, override any communications that are currently occurring, you can use this function in progress bit to, to make sure that doesn't happen. So in nets 2 and 3 is where we're going to actually be going out and reading MI10 from our slave device. You can see we have it in a two net structure here, which is generally what we would always recommend whenever you're doing any sort of communications parameters to have this, we call it a, a set hold routine, I guess, um, but or latching routine. But essentially what we're doing, when you press MB1, the request to read, this was just a button on our HMI MB1, but the positive transition of that button for the read on the HMI, we're going to set a, a next available memory bit, which in this case was MB3. So as soon as we push the button, we're going to set MB3, which goes down and is the enabling condition for NET3. So the reason we do this is if, for example, we push the, the read button, and if that, that exact instant that we push the read button, another Modbus command was occurring, uh, it wouldn't be able to read that. So the fact that we have a two NET structure, this latch and hold, when we press the read button, it's going to set MB3. It's going to have MB3 be set and waiting to read until we su successfully read. So you can notice we reset MB3 at the end of the net. So we push the button, we set the read command, we try to keep on reading until we have a, a read that's been finalized and the function block has actually been executed. That is when we reset the MB3 enabler. So again, this, this two net structure is something you can follow in any of your programs really, but it's just to make sure that your communication blocks actually do execute. Um, so to ensure that you do have your data being read or, or written, make sure a successful transmission does occur, you can have this, this set and in contact and then read the set hold command um, that we call it this two net structure. So we have in net three, as I just explained, the MB3 to enable the read, and we're also using our MB2 function in progress, which was defined in the Modbus configuration function block. So we're saying if this is, if it's currently low, if there's no function currently occurring, if nothing is in progress, then we're going to go ahead and perform our read holding register number three command. And you grab this read holding register command from under the function block menu, Modbus, and then you'll see the, all the different number commands, the Modbus standard numbers, which we support. Uh, we're going to be using the read holding register. Number three is just the one that's been grabbed down here. But you can just see the different options available as well. So I'll open up the Modbus read block, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we have going on here. So there's a couple parameters to define. First one is the, the slave ID. So the first parameter is really saying where we want to go out on the Modbus network and perform this read command from. So we only have two devices in this example. We just saw that the Modbus master was configured as slave ID 1, and our slave is defined as slave ID 2, which we'll look at a little bit later. 
but uh, you can take my word for it now that we've defined the slave controller as slave ID2. When you open that, that block, you'll see, just like we defined earlier, you have the option to select your different slave IDs. Now, the start of vector. This is where you enter in the address that you want to be able to go out and read from. Um, here it's a 10. We're going to be reading MI10 like we saw on the slave screen before. Uh, but you'll notice that nowhere in here do we define MI10 or memory long 10 if we wanted to read a memory long. What we actually have is a, a pound sign, which denotes a constant, and then a number. So we're just entering 10 here, so we're sending out. Modbus doesn't know anything about memory integers or memory longs in, in Unitronics nomenclature. Modbus just really cares about addresses. So we're really just going to be looking at, out for address 10 on the Modbus network in this case. And again, the address 10 we saw from the slave address table under Enhanced Series Controllers. The offset for memory integers starts at zero, so MI10 is just going to be a 10 decimal value or an A in hex if you if you wanted to convert it. Um, but that's why we have a value of 10 entered in on the program there. I'll show you if you want to convert. It's easiest if you open up the calculator from Windows. And Windows Calculator, when you have it set on scientific mode, standard mode doesn't have too many options, but when you set it on scientific, it allows you to see now you can convert between decimal or binary or hex is what we really care about here. So if, for example, we want to address, let's say, memory long, let's address memory long number 32. So you can see that the offset for memory longs starts at 7,000 hex. So that means what we need to do is figure out what, what memory long address 32 is in 7,000 hex offset, essentially. So the way that you would do that is you can start off by clicking the hex value in the calculator. And then I'll enter in my 7,000 hex. So I have my 7,000 hex, which equates to my memory long zero in this case. So I have my 7,000 hex, and I can't just add 32 here because a 32 hex is different than a 32 decimal. So what I have to do is convert this 7,000 hex over to decimal first. So this 28,672 is equivalent to 7,000 hex or also memory long zero. But we want to find out, in this case I just said, for an example, memory long 32. So what I'm going to do now is add 32 decimal to that 7,000 hex or 28,000 or so uh, decimal. So this 28,704 is equivalent to my memory long 32 value, which is 7,020 in hex. So again, I'll do that one more time. I have my 7,000 hex. First thing I do is convert it over to decimal. So my memory long 0 is equal to 28,672, but I'm looking for memory long 32, so I'm going to add my 32 decimal. So this 28,704 is my memory long 32. If I want to look at that in hex again, I just click back to hex and I get my 7,020. You'll notice if I do a number, for example, like 7,001 hex, convert to decimal, um, 